bless you abundantly for the blessing you are to our gathering of worship. A special word of greeting to our cable congregation. We are wonderfully blessed in the knowledge that many of you within our community are now joining us for worship. We certainly appreciate your interest and we pray the worship will be a blessing and inspiration for you. If you're new to our community or if you don't have a local church home, we would be delighted to have you come and worship and visit with us. May we bow together in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, as we gather in your house in your presence for worship, we do so, Father, with glad and grateful hearts. Father, we acknowledge readily our gratitude for who you are and for all that you're doing every moment in each of our lives. Father, grant that in our time of worship this morning, we would be especially sensitive to your presence. Father, grant that each and all of us would hear your voice that we could perceive that still, small voice of God as you speak to us, your church, your family, your children. And then, O oh God, inspire and equip us to share your word with our world, with our community, with our culture. And Father, may our proclamation of your word not only be with our speech, but with our very lives. Indeed, O oh God, may our practice of faith conform to our profession of faith. Father God, we ask now your forgiveness upon our sins. And Father, we praise you for your faithfulness through all the days of our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, as we are approaching a time of prayer, I know we would like to remember the Delaney family as their house has burned this past week. So let's please remember them. Also, we need to remember our mission team as they are leaving and going to um, Kentucky. If not, let us go to our Lord and Savior in prayer. Most gracious and loving Lord, today we thank you for loving us. We ask, Lord, that you be merciful upon us who are sinners. We ask that you forgive us for the times that we have failed you, for the times that we have not done what you would have us do and for the times that we have not seen those around us who so desperately need your love and need to know of your love. We pray, Lord, that you will enable us to be your children in this world so that we might share your love with those around us. And so those who are hurting will have a hope in you. Lord, today we lift up those who are hurting in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up the Delaney family. We ask that you strengthen and encourage. We lift up the mission team and pray that you guide and direct, that you keep them safe and strengthen them for the, your service in Kentucky. Lord, today we lift up our sisters and brothers who are sick in this church and who are struggling with illness. Lord, we lift up those who are hurting because of loss of a loved one. Lord, I pray for this community. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be poured out in this place and that people will begin right here and right now to make a difference, to share your love, to reach out to their neighbors, to love as you loved us. These things we pray as you have taught us to pray, saying...
debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory
Thanks to Brother Bob for our arousing and inspiring music. And thank you for the opportunity, Brother Bob, to let me sing with the choir. <laughs> In our worship for proclamation this morning, we're examining the sixth petition of the seven. And as you know, this sixth petition in the Lord's Prayer uh, speaks to the Father's protection. The reading of Scripture is taken from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. As you're able, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. From the very lips of Christ, we hear this Word of God. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Holy and righteous God, we are truly indebted to you for the gift of your word, your divinely inspired word, your living word. And Father God, we praise you not only for its inspiration, for, but also for its preservation. And Father, we would pray that this word might find receptivity in our hearts and our souls. And that Father, daily, under your guidance, we would give expression to your word. Not only, O oh God, with our speech and language, but with the deeds and the motives of our hearts. Father, may our lives become incarnational of your word so that, Father, through our living, we bear a witness to your truth, to your love, but most especially to your Son and to our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout his life and ministry, the Lord Jesus faced many severe trials, tests, and temptations. Indeed, he knew firsthand just how hard, how tough such circumstances can be. As the Son of Man, he was keenly conscious of the agony and the anguish of trials and temptations. And dear friends, like each of us, Christ himself could have succumbed to the temptation and have sinned, but he did not. Christ did not sin because of his absolute love for the Father and his unwavering devotion to the Father's will. So it is in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, the inspired writer tells us that as our high priest, Jesus sympathizes with our human weaknesses because he himself was tempted in every respect even as we are. And yet Christ sinned not. Therefore, when his disciples asked him on that pivotal day to teach them to pray, Jesus purposely taught them and us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. And this particular petition addresses the Father's protection. Beloved, whereas we need God's pardon for the wrongs we have done, we also need God's protection against the wrongs we may do. We need both a redemptive religion and a preventative religion. This petition addressing the Father's protection speaks to the problem of temptation. In a world such as we live, in a broken, bleeding, bruised world, as we look back in our lives, we tend to remember our sins, our mistakes, our failures, our shortcomings, and so instinctively, as we look back, we pray to God for His forgiveness. 
but within our world as it is, as we look ahead, as we anticipate days and years yet to come, we instinctively think of our imperfections, our flaws, our frailties, our weaknesses. And so in the words of Jesus we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. To modern ears, this word tempt is an unpleasant term. Usually the verb to tempt connotates an attempt to seduce into evil. But in our biblical text and in most biblical references, this verb parazine means to test, to bring to a point of trial, rather than to tempt into evil. And so as Jesus teaches us this prayer, he is praying that we will not be lured into sin, but rather in our kind of world as we're tested, as we find ourselves on trial, we will become stronger in our loyalty, our obedience, and our faith in God. All through the biblical canon, you have numerous references to God allowing his children to be tested, to be, draw, to be brought into a time of trial, to be tempted. You remember Abraham, the father of the faithful, was tested as God called upon him to sacrifice his only son Isaac. All of us can recall the story of Job, the oldest short story in the world. In the story of Job, this patriarch is tempted and tested as God permits Satan to bring to bear whatever temptations he can. And then the most notable example of temptation and testing is that of our Lord Jesus. In both Matthew and Mark's gospel, it is said of Jesus that he was driven or led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, there to be tempted and tested by Satan. Jesus, as we have read, has experienced temptation. There is no temptation you and I have encountered that Jesus himself has not previously encountered. In our daily lives, in our imperfect world, it is certainly true that often we fail in that test, in that trial. But again, from God's perspective, it is not God's intent that we fail or falter in those times of testing and trials. It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted every day of his incarnational existence. It is sin when we yield to the temptation. That temptation becomes a means and method of sin. When we yield to it, when we embrace it, when we succumb to it. And so it is in the little epistle of James, the writer has stated, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and God himself tempts no one. And so in our prayers, both public and corporate and personal, when we pray this petition, lead us not into temptation, we're asking God not to abandon us not to leave us to our own ingenuity, not to forget us. We're praying to God that in that time of testing, in those moments of trial, in that fragile arena of temptation, that God be with us to help us to be strong and faithful and obedient to him and to his word. It may very well be that even at this precise moment, as we gather before God in the context of corporate worship, that some of us are feeling a test. We find our very minds and hearts in a moment of trial. It is in the moments of our living when we are confronted that we look to God and not to self. And in the trial, in the moment of temptation, we pray quietly, intently, Oh God, lead us not into temptation. Do not forget us. Do not abandon us. Do not leave us alone into ourselves. But also this sixth petition underscores the prevalence of our human frailty. 
These words lead us not into temptation, acknowledge our human weaknesses, our shortcomings. When we pray this petition, we're acknowledging that we need help to overcome temptation. We need help be, uh, above and beyond ourselves to enable us to resist temptation. Indeed, as we verbalize these words of prayer, we're saying to God, Oh God, we need your help. We need an external, divine help. We need a help beyond our own. We need, oh God, your divine intervention to enable us to resist temptation, to maintain fidelity to you and to your word. Intellectually, we know that we need to be tested to be able to grow, to mature, to become, to maximize our potential. And yet within ourselves, we also know that we don't have the strength, the courage, the willpower to bring to bear so that indeed we can pass these tests and become all that we can be in Christ. In our day of secular humanism, postmodern man has come of age. And so our contemporaries tend to think they are more than sufficient within themselves to handle any and every trial, to overcome every temptation. When postmodern man hears the gospel and realizes his own insecurity, his own inadequacy, he becomes offended for it goes against the grain of his conditioning. Oh, that we would preach with conviction this matter of God's grace and our human frailty and that the awareness, the reality that we are weak will instinctively point us to God and to that source of help which enables us to live as more than conquerors, not in self, but in Christ Jesus who loves us and has given himself for us. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth at least four different epistles. Two of those are probably lost. But in that very first epistle to the church that is so encrusted with pride, a boasting attitude, a proud mentality, Paul says to them and through them to us, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. How our postmodern culture needs desperately to hear, to appropriate these words of divine counsel. Those early disciples of Christ knew well what Paul is saying. They could vividly remember, painfully recall that setting in the upper room that Thursday night. They had just come from the little village of Bethany. It is during the week of the Passover festivities. As they have come those few miles from Bethany to Jerusalem, they have found themselves arguing among themselves as to which of them is the greatest, who will occupy the right hand, who will sit on the left hand. And as they enter the upper room to observe the Passover, they're still embroiled in this argument of pride, number one, ego. So Jesus takes a basin of water, he bathes their feet, and then as they gather at the table, Jesus says to them, One of you will betray me. One of you, with whom I have lived as closer than a brother for three years, one of you will betray me and sell me out. According to the scriptures, beginning with one and then around the entire table, all twelve disciples ask, Lord, is it I? These men knew well their human frailty. Each one of them knew their potential, their capacity for betraying the Son of God. Oh, that something of their awareness, something of their humility could be transferred to us in the modern church. Lord, is it I? All of us are capable of succumbing to temptation. All of us have potential of turning from Christ, usurping his will, doing whatever we want to do. 
Beloved, all of us, every person has an Achilles heel. Within your persona, your personality, there is a particular weakness. There is that vulnerability. There is that part of your being where evil can get a foothold. And would that foothold attempt to destroy your very life and your soul? I pray that all of us from this pulpit to your pew will know intently our particular weakness, whatever it may be. For some people, their weakness is a sexual appetite. For others, it is greed. For some, it's a temper. With several, it is the obsession of power and position. For many, it is a craving for popularity. It is an insatiable appetite for pleasure. All of us within our persona, our being, struggle with our particular weakness. But also that weakness in you or me may be something worthy and noble in the human spirit. For even something good and noble can be twisted and warped and distorted and used for evil. So it is within our living there may be a dedication to work. There may be that ambition to succeed. There may be that loyalty to friends and family. There can be that sense of self-confidence. There can be nationalistic pride. All of these things in themselves are good and desirable. But when taken and immersed and used by Satan can become our worst enemy. Temptation in your life and in my life as in the life of Christ, is always looking for a bridgehead, for a foothold, so that it might gain a footing and from that emerge and expand his attack upon our very lives. Usually there are two sources of temptation utilized by Satan. Temptation can come, and it does come, every day, even almost every moment. The first source of temptation by Satan is from outside and beyond ourselves. One such source of temptation is the influence of bad immoral people. How we need to teach our young people that their choice of friends, their choice of associations, their networks, their circles are so crucial to their own well-being. Many a young person, even in the church, has gotten caught up in the wrong group and becomes involved in behavior that is sinful, even fatal. Many a time a young person is caught and arrested by the law and in his defense he says, I never meant for this to happen. It simply happened because of who I was with. There are harmful and dangerous associations. Again, we must teach and instruct our young people that every choice of a companion, a friend, an associate has consequences beyond that moment. There are times when the counsel and wishes of loved ones may be a source of temptation. This is especially true for those who are considering the call of God upon their lives. I can speak to this from first-hand experience. Many a time when a young person, a young adult, feels that call of God upon their heart for ministry, for missionary service. And as you share that with family and friends and congregation, there will be those who love us and care for us and they will say, I don't think I would encourage this. Look at all the trials, look at all the dangerous situations into which you might go on the foreign mission field. You can be a person here involved in a normal profession, vocation, and still be a loyal, faithful Christian to the Lord. I remember as I struggled with my call to the ministry, and after several weeks shared it with my father and then my mother, she initially was not supportive, and I could understand that. She was concerned about being dependent upon a congregation and not in every church is there a favorable, harmonious relationship. 
it took my mother a good while to adjust to the fact that her oldest son would commit his life to the ministry and to the call of God. The counsel and wishes of those who care for us can become a source of temptation and divert us from embracing and living out the will of God. But then temptation also emerges from within ourselves. Again, our weakest point, that most frail dimension of our human character, can become for us that Achilles heel that enables Satan to gain the upper hand and to dominate us. Also from within ourselves, our strongest point can be a source of temptation, especially our having overconfidence, our being overly confident in ourselves, more so in self than in God. Have you ever heard someone say when a conversation is developing and someone says, did you hear about John Doe, what he did? How could he ever do that? And someone will say with the greatest conviction, I'll tell you this, fellows, I'll never be caught doing that. I'll never do that. And when I hear that from the lips of a believer, I pause and I say to myself and to God, Lord, please let this person come to an understanding that as a human, even with the best of intentions, he is still human and can be diverted and distracted. He can be ensnared and trapped by the devil. This sixth petition acknowledges the problem of temptation. It underscores the prevalence of human frailty. But most importantly, this sixth petition stresses the promise of our deliverance. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do not bring us into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. When we pray these words of this petition, we not only acknowledge our weakness, but we also affirm God's strength and his protection available to us in our time of need. Beloved, if there were not deliverance available in the time of trial, Jesus would never have taught us to pray this petition. Thanks be to God that he is our deliverer, that we can look to him for our hope, our help, our salvation, our deliverance. Thanks be to God that where we cannot live the Christian life in self, we can live the Christian life in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. The Bible says that God will not let us be tempted beyond what we can endure. And beloved, that endurance is not found in self, on our good name, on our intellect, on our credentials. That endurance is found only in the Lord God himself. As we put our lives in him, as we put our weight upon him, God's help and his strength to help us to resist temptation are always available to us. And yet we can't expect God to help us if we do not exercise a, stain, a sane and sober judgment, we should not foolishly go looking for evil. We should not foolishly flirt with sin nor Satan. And as you well know, there are many numerous diversions and distractions. There are all kinds of temptations in our imperfect world. These include X-rated videos, pornographic websites, illicit relationships, compromising situations, demonic practices. The world is full of all these flashing signs trying to attract your attention and then to capture your soul. Thanks be to God, he has given us many allies to help us guard against evil. He is there, coming to us at our time of trial, in our moments of temptation, loaning us, giving us, giving us His strength, His power. 
among the many allies with which we're blessed to resist temptation is religious childhood training. I'm grateful to my parents that from my earliest memories, they took me and my two younger brothers to church. I'm grateful to God that in the home, especially my father, read to us the Bible, gathered with us for prayer, making sure that we were aware of God and our need of God. Other resources that help us are a good and clear conscience. Timothy says that we fight the good warfare with a good and clear conscience. You may fool everybody else. You may escape everyone else, but you can never escape yourself. And that conscience is an internal monitor, gauging and directing. And our conscience can be our very best friend, or it can be our worst enemy. There are other influences that enable us to resist temptation. The influence of those we love and respect. Many a married spouse has maintained fidelity with the spouse. Not because they were not tempted, but because in the temptation they knew that if they succumbed to that attraction, there would be loved ones hurt and disgraced. And a family would be disrupted. They are the influence of good and godly traditions, church, worship, Sunday school, Bible study. There's the influence of moral and ethical absolutes, the Ten Commandments, the teachings of Christ. Not only intellectually, but experientially, incarnationally, as we embrace the Word of God, as we taste it, as it becomes part of us. Most of all, in our temptations and our times of trial, there is the very person and presence of Christ. The Lord Jesus is no dead, distant Savior, but rather a living and reigning Master. Beloved, the Lord Jesus you embrace, the one you serve, is a living, dynamic presence. Not just a name, not just a distant personage. He is the Lord our God. Let me ask, what would you do in the morning if during the day you found Christ beside you? Or in the morning as you awaken from sleep and you prepare for the day, you suddenly discover Jesus in your home as a guest with your family. Beloved, He is beside you. He is in your home more than just a guest in our homes with our families. He should be a permanent resident with who we love and with whom we live. Jesus himself fought and defeated Satan. And now he comes to us to aid us, to rescue us, to stand beside us, to help us fight and overcome the temptations that would lead us into sorrow and sadness and separation. In 1 John 4, verse 4, the beloved apostle writes, For he, Christ, who is in you, is greater than he, the Satan, who is in the world. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can lead us astray? So when we pray this Lord's Prayer, this model prayer, and we come to the sixth petition. We're asking God to be with us. To enable us to do what we can't do within ourselves. And dear friends, when God responds and delivers us and rescues us, let us be quick to acknowledge to Him our thankfulness. And let us share that with our fellow strugglers. So, so many people try to overcome addiction. They try to do good. They try to be good. But their intentions are invested in self. And when we depend upon ourselves, even our best intentions, we set ourselves up for disappointment and defeat. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.